The glacial upper Ordovician strata of Libya is generally subdivided into two prominent lithostratigraphic units, the Melez Shokran formation and the Mamuniat formation. For a long while, things seemed rather simple. In southern Libya, uh, the stratigraphy of upper Ordovician glaciogenic deposits has traditionally be cons been considered as really a layer cake stratigraphy. Um, the traditional model, um, that's to say the one that has persisted um, for several decades, has been that the is a mud prone unit, um, the Meadow Chagrin Formation, um, laid down at or near the start of the glaciation, followed by, stratigraphically, a predominantly sandy deposit, the Mamuniat Formation. It's fair to say, I think, that the, the simple stratigraphic model that this has assumed has really turned out to be a false concept, um, certainly in the opinion of, of recent field parties down to that region. Um, basically, um, it is now accepted that the stratigraphy is more complicated than this, reflecting the various phases of incision and fill of tunnel valleys, for example. And it is also accepted that there is a, a very mud-prone unit also within the Mamuniat formation. Really um, due largely to the poor exposure of these mud-prone units, um, their interpretation has become and remains quite equivocal, um, simply because they're not, they're not well exposed, people can come to their, their own conclusions. Um, this opinion has differed quite significantly um, among my co-workers. The modern glacial concepts highlight the lateral discontinuity of upper Ordovician facies in southern Libya. Highly permeable sands may pinch out within a few hundred meters or might as well pass into poor quality sands. And also the vertical facies stacking patterns are highly variable and hard to predict. A general depositional model helps to explain what controls this complexity. Once the taconic depressions were cut, they gradually got infilled. The sea flooded the area and a green shale was deposited, the Meles Chokran. Marine conditions are indicated by the occurrence of brachiopods. Deposition of the shales was restricted to the deepest parts of the taconic depressions. The Meles is absent in areas lying on higher ground. We've also got a fairly good idea at what stage of the glacial cycle the Meles Chokran was deposited. In my opinion, um, the coarsening upward succession that we see within the Meles Chokran formation and in within another mud prone unit within the Muniat formation tends to suggest it's, it was deposited during largely ice sheet advance. So the glaciers were just in the build-up phase during Meles Chokran times. Icebergs breaking off from the glacial front drifted northwards. When the icebergs melted, pebbles and sand were set free and sank to the sea bottom. Here they were embedded as strange outsized clasts into the fine hemipelagic Meles Chokran mud, drop stones. When the sea level eventually fell, the Mamuniat times began. The Mamuniat sandstones continued to infill the Taconic depressions, where they hadn't already been filled up. And the Mamuniat did care for itself. Where necessary, ice streams and tunnel valleys eroded downwards into the ground to create new space for Mamuniat sediments. In parallel with the glacial cycles, this erosion occurred in various phases. A cannibalistic system. Younger Mamuniat eroding into older Mamuniat, 
or into the Meles Sokran, or even the preglacial substrate. Zooming in, the upper Ordovician consists of various different facies. As we would expect on a glaciated shelf, like North Africa during the, the late Ordovician, uh, we would expect to see a range of braided fluvial through marginal marine to shelf through um, offshore fasces. And that whole spectrum of depositional environments is something we also see in, in Libya. So there's not one glacial facies, there are many. And most of these facies are in fact only periglacial, so were laid down in front of the glacier, rather than beneath the ice. In fact, you might begin asking yourself, how can we be so sure there have been huge glaciers around at all? Well, let's start with the outsized clasts in the Meles Chokran muds. Some critics might say the pebbles drifted around on floating wood and then fell down. Nice try, but wood was only invented many millions of years later. So we can keep them as glacial drop stones. Or take the paleo valleys that are up to 600 meters deep. Surely these dimensions are too large to be created by a simple sea level fall. Actually trying to find specific evidence of glaciation within that formation is actually extremely difficult. Um, the evidence is very sparse. So again, we tend to rely very much on analogues, modern analogues, to identify the types of sediments and the types of structures that we would expect to have a glaciogenic origin to them. One of the key pieces of evidence that convinces us that there really is a glacial system here is the striated surfaces that we find within the formation. And these have a number of different origins. The majority of them seem to represent the scour at the base of the ice sheet uh, as it moves northwards across the southern Libyan area. But clearly in some places the ice sheet was moving across unconsolidated sediment and actually we have a broad package of sediment sitting beneath the ice sheet which is sheared. Uh, and many of the striations are in fact related to shearing of the sediment column beneath the loading of the ice sheet itself. But that is one piece of evidence which gives us quite a good degree of confidence that this really is a glaciogenic system. So we have here an example of um, one of these striated pavements. Um, it's a hand specimen that comes from oh, the Gargaf Arch, I think, in, in the Mazouk Basin. And you can see that there are a series of perfectly parallel grooves separated by, by ridges and really they're, they're a sort of V-shaped structuring cross-section. Now this is just a, a, typical, a typical hand specimen. If you can imagine this structure scaled up, scaled up to um, say a metre or so for each ridge uh, so uh, it's a metre across here, separated by a groove, a metre, separated by more grooves. This is what you also find at, um, um, at outcrop, very large scale ridges and grooves. And scaling the structure up again, you can also see similar features on satellite imagery. And uh, these, at the very largest scale, several kilometres or so in length, are really what's known as megascale glacial lineations. And once you have the rough idea that the facies could be glacial, other observations suddenly begin to make sense. We see very unusual sedimentary fasces, very high energy sedimentary fasces, thick bodies of sandstone, 40 to 50 meters in thickness, with uh, continuous upbuilding of mega ripples, if you like, large, very large scale cross bedding, which also includes um, huge clasts once more. So to me, um, I would interpret these sorts of um, sediments uh, as being deposited by very high energy sustained flows. In a glacial context, what can give you these sorts of flows? Well, the answer is catastrophic collapse of the ice sheet. Jokul helps like we see in modern day southern Iceland for example. 
there are only a few things in life that could be more horrifying than a Jökulhaup. Jökulhaup is an Icelandic word that refers to the catastrophic release of meltwater from a reservoir within or underneath an ice sheet. Often triggered by melting ice, the flood erodes everything that comes in its way. In modern Iceland, there are 100-ton boulders that got carried away. Huge clasts are ripped up from the underlying substrate and are incorporated into the flow. But even a small rise in sea level could trigger this deadly event. When the sea lifts the near coastal ice sheet from its substrate, water masses trapped near the glacier's base are suddenly freed and begin to move. The inhabitants of Gat can consider themselves lucky that they missed these catastrophic flows by 445 million years. Talking about weird things in the Mamuniat, here are more. Um, we, we also see a range of, of other um, structures that should be interpreted really in a glacial context, given what we know about the uh, depositional setting of these rocks. And these structures include really fossil push moraines. And push moraines are basically as they sound, at the margins of a glacier or ice sheet, when, when it moves forward, it tends to disrupt, deform, and bulldoze, if you like, the sediment in front of it. So, very much um, like you would see in an, an accretionary wedge, for example, near a subduction zone. It's the same sort of process, scaled down. Um, so, a series of folds, faults, um, and so on. We've certainly seen um, large-scale anticlines that rise about 30 metres or so above the wadi floor, so 30 metres in ant amplitude, probably more. Um, for it. So really fairly continuous belts of deformation over several kilometres. So it, from a petroleum exploration point of view, we should be concerned with really um, in terms of their potential for, for guiding fluid flow in the subsurface, altering and disrupting the continuity of reservoir units and so forth. In depositional terms it's the retreat which is important in terms of deformation, internal deformation within the um, reservoirs that we're dealing with then it's often the advance phase that creates the structures within the uh, sedimentary section that we see that act as barriers or baffles within the reservoirs. So where do we find good reservoirs within the complex Ordovician glacial depositional system? In tunnel valleys, okay, but where else? Good reservoirs are probably deposited where the ice is, is closest to them. It's, it's um, basically, um, like any sedimentary system, where you are closest to the source of sediment, you tend to have coarser grained and hence more uh, prospective sediments, such as sandstones. A good place for such ice proximal reservoir facies is right at the edge of the glacier. One of the keys in terms of exploration is identifying what we call ice contact fans. These are the big spreads of sand uh, which are deposited in front of the retreating ice sheet. So when the ice sheet retreat stalls at what we call a grounding line, as it melts there is a great deal of meltwater being uh, pushed out from the front of the, the glacial system and this deposits the big fan sands. And these are one of the key reservoir targets in the region. Uh, so from an exploration point of view it's very important for us to be able to identify first of all where the grounding lines are and then to be able to identify the exact position of these ice contact fans which are our primary reservoirs. The retreat of the late Ordovician glaciation and the uh, ice sheets associated with it is probably one of the fundamental aspects of understanding reservoir distribution within the Mamuniat Formation. 
Certainly the research work that we have carried out suggests that the majority of the sands that act as the primary reservoirs within this system are formed during periods of retreat and particularly during periods of standstill of the ice sheet. When the ice sheet is degrading and there are considerable amounts of uh, meltwater being flushed out of the ice sheets, it's these that lead to the deposition of the main ice contact fans, which are the primary reservoir. So rapid meltwater flows are good. Likewise, the turbulent coastal belt may help to sort out attractive reservoir quality sands. As the sea level was rising when the ice sheets retreated, we tended to have very clean sands worked back onto the shelf, producing um, really just tabular sand bodies tens of metres thick. That's one possibility for, for a good clean sand. The other possibility, which may not be recognised in Libya necessarily, nobody really knows, is the potential for very clean, well differentiated turbidites deposited immediately beyond the ice sheet at the shelf break. And we see examples of these sort of prospective fasces, if you like, in northern Morocco, where we can see differentiated turbidites up to 400 metres in thickness. So um, it's, it's something always to bear in mind. Glacial processes and facies are the key to understanding reservoir quality in southern Libya. But this is not yet the end of the reservoir story. Because the end of sedimentation is the beginning of burial and of diagenesis. Clearly, depth of burial plays another key role in controlling reservoir quality. Feldspars and some other silicate grains can't stand the heat and pressure in the subsurface. When these unstable grains come in contact with inflowing meteoric water, they become easily dissolved. From this, new minerals are generated and begin to block the pore network. At shallow depths, kaolin forms. If burial continues, the kaolinite is later transformed into dikite. Most kaolinite and dikite simply replace the original grains and therefore are rather harmless for the reservoir. Not so the quartz overgrowth. When temperatures in the ground reach 80 degrees centigrade, the quartz grains begin to grow. Larger grains means less room between the grains. An effective reduction in pore space, a problem increasing with depth. Another big pore blocker is siderite. This stuff is capable of infilling even large intergranular pores. At shallow depth, it's the magnesium-poor siderite. At greater depth, the magnesium-rich version. Outcrop samples therefore help us with the facie side of the reservoir quality. For the diagenetic burial story, however, we need samples from the deep subsurface. And even desert weathering may change the petrographic composition of the Ordovician sandstones. In this outcrop near Wal El Kebir at the eastern Murzuk margin, a few hits with a hammer convert the sandstone back into a sand. Attacked by weathering, the cement has largely gone. This gives us a good excuse to play with some really exciting tools in the field. Let's rock! Using a rock drill, the outer weathering zone is easily penetrated. The cores provide less weathered sample material for thin section and permeability study.
and then and well, then we're going to get really continue. good car again. Huh? Wow, beautiful. Ah, it's going to have to come out with some of this. Oh. reason to drill more? Mamuniat and Mele Shokran together are up to 200 meters thick. How long did it take to deposit all these sands and muds? How long did the glaciers actually rule over southern Libya? So the Ordovician glaciation is something that has always been argued about in terms of its length. Um, going back into the 1970s, the estimates were of the order of 25 to 30 million years in duration for this glacial episode. So looking back to when um, Antarctic ice sheets began to grow about 40 million years ago, that would be of a, around about the same sort of length. Um, however, today we find ourselves in the position where the length of the glaciation is, is thrown once more into, into controversy. Um, in the mid-90s there were some suggestions that um, by a group working in Liverpool under Pat Brenchley that um, the glaciation was of the order of 0.5 to 1 million years in, in duration. And this was continued um, quite recently um, by Owen Sutcliffe and co-workers to suggest that the glaciation was of the order of 200,000 years based on Milankovitch cyclicity that we see in, in Pleistocene glacial sediments. However, the the cat has been thrown amongst the pigeons again, so to speak, and um, really there are suggestions from American workers in, in the United States that the glaciation may have actually began um, 10 million years earlier than previously thought, so it's, it's a controversial subject. Bearing in mind that the, the precise duration of, of the glaciation is still up for question, um, we can say with some certainty that the maximum glacial conditions appear to have occurred during the Hanantian. This is, that's to say the, the last um, stage in the, the Ashgill, the very end of the Ordovician. And we can say this on the basis that um, the glaciogenic deposits contain a very characteristic fauna known as the Hanantia fauna, a series of brachiopods primarily which have been collected from um, the Medeshagram formation in Libya and also in the uh, equivalent succession in the um, Antiatlas of Morocco, for example. When a lot of ice is piled on a piece of land and the glaciers advance, the land begins to subside, glacial loading. When the same glaciers retreat and finally disappear, the land rises, glacial rebound. Unfortunately, loading and rebound are quite hard to identify in the sedimentary record. Much of the vertical movements may be counterbalanced by inverse polarized glacio-oystatic sea level changes so that shoreline shifts are hard to predict. During loading, the oystatic sea level falls as a lot of the ocean's water is incorporated into the ice sheet. And during rebound, oystatic sea level rises due to the large quantities of glacial meltwater. And yet we think we found something that points in the direction of a nice glacial rebound story also for southern Libya. At the end of the glaciation, uh, we know that there appear to have been several strange effects upon this stratigraphy, upon the pre-existing rocks that were deposited during the, the height of the, the late Ordovician glaciation. On the Gargaf Arch at the northern margins of the Mazuk Basin, we see evidence of extensive growth faulting, half graben basin development and so on that appear to uh, have their, their faults, their master faults, roughly uh, parallel to the pre-existing uh, structural grain, that's to say a north, west, south, east oriented uh, structural grain. Okay? So there's the possibility that deep basement faults were reactivated 
as the ice sheets withdrew from the platform back onto the, onto the shelf. The glaciers went away and never returned. The Ordovician sands gradually subsided into the ground and waited. Waited for precious goods to arrive. When these finally came, they stayed until, yes, until the day when the drill bit struck. We hit some sand and uh, they sent the, the chippings up. Remember that very clearly. And um, so when we got the chippings, Ian Hodgson, who was the well site geologist at that point, gave me the privilege, and it was a privilege, of, of basically looking at the chippings under the fluorescent. And uh, so I put the, the tray of, of chippings into the, into the machine, and, uh, and there was the first indication that we had oil. It, it glowed, it fluoresced, and, uh, and he was sort of ed edging me on behind, saying, you know, what, 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 is there any fluorescence there? And I said, yes, there was. So that was the first indication that things were looking reasonably good. The first call came up um, at one o'clock in the morning. I remember that very, very well. Um, and the, as the call came out, it was this dripping oil. And I remember the, 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 the driller at that point, the Croatian guy, I think he, I think he was, he, um, he basically uh, said, this is sweet oil. And I remember those words. And we knew that the porosity was good. I remember the, the, the Korean, um, Jun Su, next to me at that point, was, was standing to attention, taking everything very seriously. And it didn't matter a word all through the whole proceedings. <laughs> I remember that. The order vision had delivered. An elephant was born. The elephant oil field discovered by Lasmo and partners is a giant. With more than 1.2 billion barrels in place, it's still the biggest discovery made in Libya during the last 30 years. And it's also the biggest oil field in the Murzuk Basin today. Nobody, nobody came out at the time. Um, there was lots of uh, discussions in the canteen at the well site by everybody there as to what we'd actually found. I mean, we, all, we realized it was big. Um, I mean, it was a huge bump. Um, I remember um, the, the guys back in Tripoli wanting to know everything. And uh, Mike Buck, who was the general manager at that point, was, in having a, was on holiday in Paris with his wife and some friends. And he was told of the news while in a restaurant in, in Paris and basically uh, made the first toast. And he cut his holiday short. The day I left um, the site, um, I remember going, uh, walking up this little hill um, to get away from, from, from the noise and just to experience the beauty of the desert. And I remember sitting on top of this hillock and um, thinking to myself how this area is going to change um, in the next few years because of this discovery. That I remember, I remember very clearly in the silence of the, of the desert. The LASMO exploration team was delighted and with every piece of information that arrived, the excitement kept growing. Only one man did not take part in the celebrations. LASMO Grand Maghreb's key geologist had disappeared. Calls to his mobile phone remained unanswered. Where was he? On the day of the uh, elephant discovery, I sadly was on holiday in Pembrokeshire, having discovered I was going to be posted into pa to Pakistan in a month's time. So uh, I had a mobile phone to keep on contact with Tripoli and London, but the mobile phone did not receive a, f a signal in Pembrokeshire. And it was only three days later, after discovery, that I went somewhere where the signal was obtained to find 19 messages. And several of them were, we've cut an oil, uh, a core, in the top of the elephant discovery and it's 100% sandstone, 100% oil dripping. Um, so by the time I found out about it, we'd cut oh, 100 metres of core, I think, all, all sandstone, all oil dripping. So I'm very excited, but sadly on the day, I was on holiday. 
walking along the coast of Pembrokeshire. So although there was initially excitement in the office, certainly, it was several days before it really began to dawn on us that this was a very, very important discovery that we had made. And obviously as that began to dawn on people in the office, the level of excitement became tremendous. Um, it was a huge discovery for us, uh, and one that was in very many ways to change the face of the exploration portfolio that we held in Libya at that time, but also in many ways to change the face of the company LASMO that was involved in drilling that major discovery in the first place. Uh, strangely, when it was announced to the press, the LASMO share price dropped about 2p. Uh, on concerns about the expense of developing such a big discovery. Uh, which was disappointed, but NOC and indeed our partners ENI and the Korean consortium were very excited by a big discovery. I think the elephant discovery uh, turned the spotlight onto the Mazout Basin. The discovery of the elephant field is, is one of those classic stories in, in exploration history. Uh, when LASMO took the block in the Mazouk Basin NC-174, which ultimately contained the elephant discovery, we recognised very clearly at that time that there was likely to be a working petroleum system in the region. Uh, we had a lot of evidence that um, we were going to encounter the late Ordovician glacial system as the reservoir. We knew that the basal Silurian hot shale was a working source rock in the region. So we had very considerable hopes for the block when we acquired it. In fact, LASMO was lucky that the elephant was still there. It wasn't virgin territory that the company started to explore in the early 1990s. Others had been looking around that area a few years earlier and discovered various large fields north of NC-174. The proven oil finders of the Romanian company Rum Patrol smelled the elephant, but in the end, let it go. Elephant fields, uh, which uh, discovered by uh, Lasmo in uh, has been part of NC-105 uh, concession. Uh, in, uh, in, in time of exploration stage, we can see that uh, part of uh, elephant can see it under 2D seismic. But people, they still uh, thinking if uh, they, can, they have the possibility to drill uh, this, uh, this well or not. But due to the prob topographic problems where this uh, this uh, field is located on the escarpment, the way we call it, Messac escarpment, with more or less around 200 uh, meters higher than uh, our gravel area or where we have our main fields A, B, and H. And then they considered that uh, mob, mob, the mob of the equipment and other things. They say, okay, maybe we, are, we can postpone to drill this one, and then we're still not sure that we have, so it will be a discovery or not. And in this area, especially that the seismic, that we have a lot of problems. Today also we have, uh, there is a lot of problems if you see the seismic data in this escarpment area. That's why with all these risks they evaluated and then decide to not to move to this area. Except that in later on May we, we decide if this area is still keeping to our side. Keeping it in reserve was certainly a good plan. Exploration agreements with NOC, however, meant that ROM Patrol finally had to relinquish this part of their concession. For once, the elephant had successfully escaped the hunters. Nevertheless, soon others were on the scene to continue the search. The attraction, I mean, came when Libya introduced the EBSA 3 in the late 80s and then the Morzak Basin was opened for the uh, licensing ground. Uh, the, uh, the NC-174 was just uh, at the southern boundary of NC-115 where there were those major three oil fields discovered by the Rome Petrol. So that part of the basin attracted uh, different European 
operators, among them LASMO, and they succeeded in uh, sanctioning uh, uh, an exploration commitment uh, with the uh, Libyan NOC. Uh, we were encouraged by the large ROM patrol discoveries, although we knew very little at the time. Uh, we also saw that the uh, uh, Bulgarians, Boko, had made some smallish discoveries, and the Brazilians had made one small discovery out of eight wells. So we recognised the petroleum systems that we thought should be there, but we didn't really understand at the time what were the critical factors controlling the prospectivity. We went through a very detailed and full exploration program that involved us uh, acquiring 2D seismic data over the vast majority of the block and then in succession drilling four wells. There were plenty of prospects and really huge uh, uh, anticlinal and fault bounded traps. Uh, we uh, discovered two small fields with the first well, A1, which was a North Scorpion prospect, and also a small field with the C1 well which was the Camel Prospect. The uh, B1 well had good oil shows but a poor reservoir and the D1 well was the only one that was absolutely dry. Um, the results encouraged us in that we obviously had a uh, petroleum system capable of working but the fields were much smaller than we'd originally mapped. Uh, we were encouraged to try and uh, drill more wells. Management was encouraged by the results, but disappointed we hadn't found a good-sized field. The disappointment actually uh, made the company uh, a, a, a bit uh, aware that uh, where is this potential now? Is there a good understanding uh, about basic play elements like the oil charge, the migration pathways, the source kitchen uh, uh, situations or, or positioning? So those big questions started to arise. In the beginning, they thought that the play is very simple. But later on, after the drilling of the second well, we understood that still many basic questions has to be answered related to the reservoir, to the source rock, to the migration, uh, to the blade fairway, indeed, uh, uh, the main one, which is the Campro Division blade. After the first drilling campaign, a decision was made by the management to uh, farm out an interest in the block by all of the partners. Uh, reducing their interest, uh, the two main partners, to a third each. And that uh, the Mazouk uh, block and indeed the CERT acreage was farmed out to Ajip. However, we decided to continue with the exploration programme and acquired additional seismic data in order to firm up some more leads uh, and identified a couple of new prospects at the same time and we decided that we would drill probably two more wells in the basin before making a final decision. Uh, all of the prospects were uh, examined or re-examined and uh, uh, ranked. Also we recognised a very big structure, elephant, the elephant structure, which uh, half of which lay outside the original NC174 block. So an extension was applied to cover the rest of this prospect. Uh, we decided to drill uh, a prospect called Ostrich first because it had a lower technical risk and it was also surrounded by about six other features of a similar size. It wasn't particularly big. The fifth well that we drilled was also dry and at this point in time I think it's fair to say we were all very concerned and very worried uh, about the future prospectivity of the block. There was one very large structure remaining on the eastern side of the block that became known as the elephant structure and many people think it was called the elephant structure simply because it was a very large structure on the block. Actually it was named the elephant structure because there is a superb prehistoric rock carving of an elephant that was identified and found in the wadi that underlies the well location. The F1 and C174 was a discovery with, with uh, a certain fear, I mean the decision to drill that a prospect uh, because of the size of the trap. The size was really substantial, it's large uh, 
uh, fault bounded trap about 35 kilometer, square kilometers in area and uh, with a huge uh, vertical displacement on the fault. So, but the main risk on that prospect was the uh, charge, the, the, the migration uh, routes. Uh, they were not identified and the lack of control. So people decided to drill that prospect because of its size. And that was really a kind of encouragement. With the risk, they took the risk of the migration, oil migration to the prospect. Despite that risk, there was some encouragement from senior geologists in the company to drill that, uh, that prospect. So it was with some trepidation that we drilled what was intended to be the final well on the block. The structure, quite frankly, was just too large to leave behind. Uh, and as happens so many times in exploration, when you drill the last hope on the block, it's the one that gives you the huge discovery that you have been waiting for through the entire exploration history. And that's exactly what happened in this case. Obviously, when a discovery the size of the elephant field is made in a basin, it changes everybody's perception of the petroleum potentiality of that particular region. Uh, and it was very clear from, from the discovery that the potential to find significant quantities of hydrocarbons in the Mazouk Basin had been improved considerably. And that created a great deal of interest in the industry. Uh, and many, many companies started to look at exploration in the southern Libyan basins from that point forward. It was really one of the turning points, I think, in exploration in southern Libya. Clearly, in the past, there had been the majority of focus on the Sirti Basin uh, and on the Mesozoic system. There had, of course, been other discoveries within the Paleozoic system. But this, again, really changed the face of exploration. And everybody at this point recognized that the Paleozoic, and the, particularly the deeper Paleozoic, was one of the areas where future reserves were likely to come from for Libya. The elephant oil is stored in the glacial Memuni at Sandstone. In fact, all other commercial fields discovered in Murzuk are also reservoired in this unit or the underlying pre-glacial Hawaz sands. Where did all the oil originally come from? What is the source of the southern Libyan black gold? <laughs> 